the German, you know, von Hindenburg. That, that's his role. So. Yeah. Oh, that or that, huh? Well, it's the mask. And it works. He's made a career out of it. And uh, uh, we got along famously because uh, I may have a little of that in me, too. And we recognized that uh, this was no time for bullshit. And so we hit it up. We never had a, a crossword. Of course, I probably lack critical detachment, a guy that gives you a goddamn fortune to make a movie out of your book, you know. Did you do the rewriting for that? No. Who did the screenplay? Uh, I forget his name. I, I thought he... I learned from it's a different medium. Yeah, it's yeah. really wild. Yeah, well, it is, uh, indeed. Mm -hmm. The transfer, like, all that you have in it, even like a... 200 page book on the film, you lose so much of it. Well, it's got to be so scenic, and, uh, and uh, I um, discovered from this experience that um, uh, a fiction is really, it's, it's, it's an inner story, really. I don't care what the scenes are. How, how dramatic! It's really it's sifted through one consciousness. Yeah, right. It's one view. This is right. It's a view of the world through one piece of broken beer bottle. And the movie, of course, cannot do that. It can do many things a novel can, mm -hmm. but it cannot uh, run on about the scene and freeze it. Well, they can freeze it, but they can't. Take a half an hour for this flash and keep for that. It's, they, they, I don't know, it's a goddamn interesting. I've never. Yeah, it fascinates both of us. We like, we spend the rest of our lives working on that. Like, well, I, I, I think the movies can do, I mean, they can do so many things that books can't. Mm. But you can, you know, you can appreciate the fact more than anyone else that uh, trying to take Morris here as, as an artist, as a, uh, an engineer, as you know, a family man or whatever he was, and we're focusing in on basically the rod maker, what he did. By the way, are you recording now? Mm -hmm. Oh, I, <laughs> I just, I, I just want to know so I can freeze up. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Now, where, where is my it's big word back. dictionary? <laughs> Oh. Yeah. Oh. That's just shooting. But this is, I, I just want to well, Like I said, we'll edit yeah. this. Yeah. But so I'm, we, I'm we've just, ended I'm up. Just gonna get a few shots well, let's get down to more, Sam. Yeah. All right. Well, we ended I've up. written a good deal of this, but I've got to repeat it. You yeah. know, I mean, That's, there's only one more story, and it's the one I know. Uh, I think we met when he wrote me a letter. And uh, I think it was, well, I beat around. I think it was a fan letter. He said, I'm a fisherman too, and I liked my story or book or whatever it was he'd read. And he said, I'm going through to Montana fishing, and I'd like to drop by and say hello. Well, fair enough. Very discerning reader. <laughs> so I wrote back, Dear Mr. Kushner, uh, my wife's out of town, and I get in touch with me early or late. If you miss me at the house, try the Rainbow Bar. I generally play cribs there in the morning. So, a uh, game or two. And uh, anyway, no, it wasn't the Rainbow then, it was the Imperial. So, geez, one morning at the Imperial Bar, we're playing four-handed cribbage. And in walk, Grandpa Kushner. And I, I had, of course, had never met him. And I've written this elsewhere. But he said, good morning. I said, good morning. He said, I'm Morris Kushner. Well, I thought it was an Irish, retired Irish railroader, because we we have, this is great, 
old railroad town. It's the northern terminal of the Northwestern Railroad. You look for all the world like an old, retired Irish railroader. The blue eyes and the, the dark suit and, and the unlit cigar, you know, big unlit cigar and a fedora hat, as I remember, that only the railroaders wear that in a certain way. And uh, so it was Grandpa Kushner. So the game ended and we went fishing. And I took him to uh, first place we went. I loved to fish ponds and he said he did. First place I took him was, well, this is southeast of Ishpeming, where we are today. I took him north entirely different country, much, much rockier and rugged. It's, there's some rugged terrain around here, as you've noticed. Mm -hmm. And I took him into this old beaver dam, and uh, we walked down in a beautiful spot. It was kind of a sunny day like this, but uh, there was a trout rising across. I've told this before. Do you want, are you... Please you want to hear it again? Yeah, I read the whole story and I'd love for you to get it. Well, I, this is what I remember about him. Mm -hmm. And I uh, said, it looks like a nice fish. He said, yeah, it does indeed. I don't know if he called me judgy or not. Uh, it does. And I said, well, uh, if you want to try for him, I, you can, there's a ford up above. Well, he said, why not from here? From here, I said, it was a cast of, I guess, about 70 feet and not much room for back casting, brush and all that. And, uh, well, he said, I'll try it for him. And so, anyway, he tried for it and he laid a fly over the fish. I don't know if, I can't remember what I even wrote about it, but I don't know if he caught the fish or missed it or broke off on it or what, but he got action on an incredible cast. Uh, and uh, I said, my God, <laughs> what kind of a rod are you using? He said, one of my own. Oh, what do you mean, one of your own? Uh, you bought the blanks? No, he said, I, I made the thing from scratch. He said, you know, I'm a... I forgot what he told. Is it a tool and die maker? Mm -hmm. He said, that's what I've been doing for years or down there in the, uh, for the automobile people. And, I, and so I started making fly rods. And he said, I... Got the machinery, I made the machinery to make the fly rod. Well, I said, uh, would you mind if I tried to see if I could cast halfway with your rod? Be God, he handed me the rod. And I cast across there. I, I could forget if there was a fish rising, but I wanted to see. It's an incredible cast that I made, and I am no fancy caster. So, uh, anyway, we fished along, and I forget all the sequence, but that is a spot. He loved it, by the way. It is a, was and is a beautiful spot, except that a house painter from Detroit bought the place. <laughs> we used to fish there all the time. We come there one day. It's uh, no trespassing, private property, get the hell off, and all this. In fact, it's the reason I bought this spot. I thought this was public land, that, you know, that we could fish there any time we wanted. It wasn't. It was private land. And a guy bought it who doesn't even fish. God knows what he does up there. And uh, anyway, um, I'm getting my stories mixed up because... At least the dam, there were a series of three dams there, and we were fishing one of them, and I knew it was for sale. My, meanwhile, I'd bought this place, 
because I, when this house painter bought this favorite spot up north, I said, good God, what'll happen? What's my next favorite spot? Uncle's. Well, that's public land, I said, you know, to myself, says I. And, uh, but I said, after all, you thought uh, Weasel was, too. Do you conduct interior monologues, Mr. Roman? Oh, a beautiful ride! Uh, well, anyway, um, I said, this spot is for sale. I guess the guy had, I forget the sea cats crisis some years back. Anyway, Scott's grandpa reached down. He says, I, look, let's buy it together. I'll make the down payment. Got a, I said, I got a grand right here. <laughs> we got lost in that. You want to hear that, Scott? Yeah, I do. I'm coming right over there. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't want to. Yeah. But I. May God, he. I said, you carry that kind of dough around? All the time, he said. You never know. You, you never know what happened. Lose the wheel. Anyway, I think he was driving a Cadillac or a, something. As I said, a Doberman pincer. If I can't remember the name, it's a Doberman. Oh, you know, yeah, and he had it full of fly rods. He had uh, that he made. And, you know, and you, usually when a guy says he makes a fly rod, he buys his blanks from somebody and glues them together. But he explained it. Anyway, I... This fly rod that I used when we broke up that day, he made a presentation ceremony. Judgey, your rod. What? You know, I went into ecstasies of refusal, grabby at it. <laughs> yes, he said, you you like it, the gas well, it's yours. So, I... Then we, uh, I don't know if it was on that trip. He didn't stay very long. He was truly passing through to Montana. I don't know, every year then it became a kind of a thing. Yeah. He'd stop by, usually drop me a note, and we usually meet at the cribbage game in the morning and take her from there. Uh, my favorite cribbage partner died, I won't say out of frustration, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but the poor guy died, so I don't get to play quite so much. The other guy builds houses now. Uh, so we came out here, and again, and we was casting down below the bridge there. And he was making some beautiful casts. I don't think he claimed to be a polished expert fisherman any more than I do. I write books about it, I, you know. I leave it to Lee Wolf and Swisher and these guys to be the scientists at it. I just loved to fish, and, and your grandfather didn't. He loved it. It was a private ecstasy. I, hey, well, one question. Yeah. You all, you love to fish. You love to fish, and, and Morris loved to fish. Did he love getting the fish more than other people? Or did he love to fish? Uh, I, I think it was fairly irrelevant whether he... Oh, uh, I, I think it'd be a pose. I mean, I, I don't say a fisherman is a poet going around. He, there's ego, there's chase. It's a, it's a form of seduction, really. And so, once in a while, you got to catch the mermaid, you know. <laughs> And uh, so he he had he had a, a good ego about his fishing, but it was healthy. It wasn't competitive, or we weren't fighting each other, showing off. I think that's why we hit it off. <laughs> we were relaxed with each other. And, uh, I could take a drink too. I don't know if you knew that. I don't know what his doctor thought about it, but he 
like the belt of booze. I don't think it was any, you know, just, and he'd expand and pull out a new cigar. <laughs> At that time, I think I was still smoking, so we, when we both got puffy, me and my Italian cigars, we'd send up quite a smudge. <laughs> Can we stop for a while? Sure. Every time he'd come up here, he'd give me at least one new Morris Kushner rod. I think they ran from six feet to eight and a half. I don't think he built any nine-footers. I think the big thing about his rods, uh, it might have expressed him. Uh, they were beautifully and perfectly built, I'm told, by people who know rods. That, well, I've got an old fishing friend called Hal Lawa, and he said there's no rod made like the Kushner rod. No, Leonard, the whole bit, English, the hardy, no rod, because they didn't have the machinery that Morris knew how to make. See, here was a... Morris learned... Mit this meticulous measurements, I don't even know the terms that you had to make to make a car work. This is before front wheels dropped off and all this, you know, and we still cared if cars ran around the block. And uh, they had to be right, so he made his rods this way. And uh, they had a lot of power. I've been trying to tell you how, to, I mean, it's, after all, it's a little wand, it's a fairy wand, a small light fly rod, but he also uh, put this power in. I think it was your uncle, uh, not the one that, it was it the one that died? Yeah. Yeah, Seen that wrote there. me. Yeah. yeah and, and then they used, I remember it was a lovely letter. I wanted to get a little more background on your gramp uh, for writing my piece. And I think he said something like this. See, this was, I mean, uh, here's Morris, a poor immigrant. Came here and he made it. But he made it making money for a hell of a lot of other people, see, which is nothing more than the automobile thing is about. And his expression, this was his way of, of, uh, I guess, expressing himself. This is the artist came out, making fly rod. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, the thoughts. Well, oh, yeah. well, a week ago, a week ago, this very day, there were a, lot, a flock of fishermen here. We kind of have a, you know, a, an opening. And this week, the this year the glacier lingered so long we didn't have it on the first day we set it on the 21st so naturally we had one of the earliest breakups in years <laughs> but anyway the guys congregated there from Chicago Detroit my god far places below the Straits and a lot of local fishermen and I'll bet you half of those guys own Kushner Rod and at least half of those have two or more. In fact, there's a friend in, just thought of it, a friend in Cincinnati who fishes up here. He used to work for the soap company there. And I think he, he bought six Kushner rods I, through your dad after your grandpa died. And uh, I, uh, Actually, I got a commission on it, I guess. I think your dad sent me a rod, finally. I got so many Kushner rods, I was renting space, you know. So I gave a rod to Charles Corral when he was up here. And uh, I gave a rod to the editor of my last book, Nick Lyons. He's a, you, you may never have heard of him, but uh, he, in the fishing world, he's up there with Swisher and and uh, Lee Wolf and all these magicians and, and uh, uh, Nick Lyons mentioned it uh, in a recent story of his uh, how John Volker had given him this Kushner rod 
Was that in Field and Stream? No, it was in Fly Fisherman magazine. I, I think my dad had that story. Or somebody printed it for him. I Because uh, it mentioned the rock. Yeah, it did. But this guy in Cincinnati, uh, evidently some cousin of yours works for Procter & Gamble. I think it's a gal. Yeah, that's right. And by accident, small world, uh, Ed runs into her and somehow, I I don't know if he, it, it was a contact with your dad. And I guess every lot speech in the Middle West now, in, in Cincinnati, now is, goes around armed with a Kushner rod. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, I, th I, guess, I think uh, my cousin's connection with with the rods was instrumental in, in her getting a, a real nice job with the Camp. No kidding. Yeah, she's that a, a, she was just a uh, freelance artist. And they, they gave you see what Grandpa did? Gram Grandpa's name happened to... He was uh, as pervasive as... We went, yeah, he was. Yeah. He just covered so many things. I'm, I'm always. Well, he's a dominant personality, uh, just like I'm speak of, spoke of Preminger a little while ago. When we met, uh, I, I, I'm not trying to analyze myself, but I'm. My wife tells me I'm. Uh, uh, overbearing sometimes, and uh, anyway, for, for Kushner and I to meet is like. It's a good basis for friendship, see, because we're wary of each other and uh, very not. careful, very careful. And uh, we hit it off. It was fun to see him. And one summer he came through with a new Cadillac and your gram. And uh, and uh, I told you the story about the Harley Davidson when he was a young guy around Detroit, you know, yeah. courting her on the Harley Davidson motorcycle. Of course, she blushed like a girl to hear him tell this. And I remember the old Detroit. I'm an old guy myself. and I mean, this is it. The old Hudson, I remember the old Hudson factory out East Jefferson. My mother's people came from Detroit. So, yeah. And a lot of the kids from up here didn't want to work in the mine or couldn't get a job. They'd flock $5 a day, Henry Ford. Would like plumbers. Mm. Do nothing, too. Yeah.